Station, this is Mike Williams at School of the Osage. How do you hear me? Mike at School of the Osage, I hear you loud and clear. Thank you. We will go ahead and start in with our questioning then. Great to see you. Yeah, Mike, it's great to uh, hear your voice, and I'm, I'm very happy that we've got the opportunity to do this. I was getting a little worried because uh, I've only got uh, less than two weeks left up here, so I'm very happy to speak to, uh, to everybody there at School of the Osage. Colonel Hopkins, my name is Devin Scrivener. I believe the administration of School of the Osage chose my question based on academic merit alone. The question is as follows. Do you ever feel like Superman pushing off the walls of a space station? Well, I don't know if I, if I could say uh, Superman, but uh, certainly flying around the space station is, is absolutely fantastic. It's one of my, my favorite things. But uh, in terms of the strength and all that, you get put down to earth pretty quick as soon as we get on our weight machine up here and try and lift some weights. Thank you very much. Hello there, my name is Michael Minahan. I have a question for you, Rick. What is the most amazing thing you have seen in space so far? <laughs> that is a perfect question for, for today, because last night, Mike and I were in the Node 3. This is where we wash up. We were brushing our teeth, getting ready to go to bed, and we were about to close the uh, windows on the cupola, and we looked out, and we could see the southern lights. We were on the southern tip of Africa, I believe, and it's starting to turn and head north, and we could see south of us all these great aurora, the southern lights, aurora australis. And it was just an incredible light show. And then we could see a little bit of the sun. As the sun began to rise, we could see this blue line. We could see this green haze. We could see these red lines shooting off the, off the planet. And then we could see the star or the planet Venus rising through all of it. And then, then we got the crescent moon coming through. And it was an incredible show. And that's something I don't think either of us will ever, ever forget. Thank you. Hi, my name is James Coates, and I'd like to know how you handle interpersonal conflicts in space. Yeah, you know, that's, that's an absolutely fantastic question because um, communication is, is the way you handle those, and, and that can be difficult sometimes. Uh, so you always have to, to be able to communicate uh, amongst us up here, but, but probably even more importantly is uh, how we communicate with the ground. And, and so you need to make sure you keep those lines of communication open and sometimes that can be difficult because, of course, we, we don't see the ground, uh, and so our only interaction with them is, uh, for the most part, over the space-to-ground loops. Thank you. Hello, I'm Amy Ekstrom, and I would like to know, um, how messed up have your sleeping patterns gotten while you're in space? Well... Our sleeping patterns are actually pretty normal up here. We follow a standard 24-hour day. Even though we're going around the Earth 16 times a day, we follow a pretty standard day that we that everybody or most folks follow uh, back on, on Earth. Uh, we, we're up, uh, we work 12-hour uh, days. We get a couple hours of free time to eat dinner and relax. And then we get about eight, eight and a half hours of sleep time. Of course, we don't need to sleep that much. But uh, at night, when it's time to go to bed, we basically turn all the lights off here in the space station and we crawl into our small crew quarters quarters and go to sleep, no problem. It's very, very comfortable sleeping up here. Thank you. Hi, I'm David Wormuth. Uh, Mike, who do you give thanks to for helping you reach your goals? Well, first and foremost is God, and then I'd have to say uh, my parents and, and then my wife and kids. And certainly without any of those, uh, I wouldn't be here uh, today. And, and I, I do want to give a special thanks to, to my wife and kids because uh, they've certainly borne a, a lot of the brunt of, of the time away and all of that uh, during the training. And then, of course, while I'm up here as well. So uh, that's, uh, I guess that's who I would give thanks to the most. Uh, thanks. Uh, 
Um, hi, my name is Ashlyn Doyle. Um, what does it feel like knowing you're up there above Earth and life is continuing down below? Yeah, that's interesting. There's a lot of different ways I can answer that question. Of course, uh, you know, I'm missing a lot of things back at home. We were up here for the holidays, for Thanksgiving and for Christmas. Uh, and those are the kind of things that are the hardest when you know the family's getting together and your friends and family are getting together and they're having a good time without you. And you just feel like, uh, you know, you're missing something. And so that makes it hard to be up here. But, the, you know, the trade-off is, is we get to do this fantastic work up here. We get to live in this incredible environment and we get to get, see the beautiful things we see out the window. So, uh, you know, it's a trade-off. Like everything else, it's a trade-off. But I think, uh, I think we got the better end of the deal. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Jessica Smith. My question for you is, what does it take to be an astronaut? Yeah, you know, uh, to, to be an astronaut, one, it takes a little bit of luck. And, and two, I think it takes uh, perseverance and hard work. And, uh, you know, I, I applied four times before I was selected. I think Rick was, was the same way. Um, so you can't get discouraged. You got to be patient and uh, you got to work hard in school and, and whatever job that you do afterwards. And probably the most important part about that job, whatever you go into, is that it's something that you love and you're passionate about. And, uh, and then, you know, if, uh, if you get the chance to be an astronaut, that'll all take care of itself. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Andrea Robinette, and uh, is it hard to swallow food up there since there's like no gravity? Yeah, fortunately, uh, to swallow food isn't isn't uh, any harder up here than it than it is down on Earth. Um, and so, uh, very fortunate that way. Um, so, yeah, it's it's uh, pretty much the same. Hi, I'm Nicole, and I was wondering if you ever get tired of eating space food. Uh, oh, space food, yeah. Oh, space food. Do we get tired of space food? Well, we got a lot, a wide variety of space food. You know, here's, uh, we got barbecued beef brisket. We got tortillas here. Here's an example of, uh, these are freeze-dried Italian vegetables. Mm -hmm. You know, and then some, some of the food comes in just its normal form. Here's a, an energy bar, for example. So we get all different types of food. We got all different types of drink. Here's a drink bag. You know, we can't pour our drinks in a cup, so they all come up in bags like this. So we got a wide variety of food, but the thing that I think uh, that we do miss is our favorite foods. You know, it would be great to have, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, my wife makes some great pasta, a great pizza, or a good steak dinner, or some fresh vegetables, a salad, things like that. So we miss a lot of those kind of things, but we do have a pretty good selection of food up here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michaela, and I was wondering what does the sunrise look like from outer space? Yeah, the sunrise. So Rick mentioned that we go around the Earth 16 times a, a day, so we get to see a lot of sunrises, and, and they, tru uh, they truly are incredible. Uh, basically, what you'll see at the limb of the Earth is you'll, you'll, it'll be very dark, and then you'll start to see just this very thin line of blue. And that thin line of blue will just get a little bigger, a little bigger, and then you'll start to see some, some orangish red come in there. And that'll start to grow a little bit as well. And you can start to see, pick out some clouds that'll be a little darker in there. And then all of a sudden the sun will come up and, and it'll just be this blinding light, uh, very, very bright. And, and so they're absolutely uh, fantastic. Thank you. Hi, I'm Savannah. I was wondering what your daily routine is up in space. Our daily routine up here is probably not unlike, uh, you know, what you do, what you do, getting ready for school, or if you have a job, 
you know, we get up in the morning, we uh, get ready for work. You know, the only difference is everything is right here, right? We're in this small space station. Well, it's a pretty big space station, but it's all, everything's located right here. We get up, we get ready for work, we get dressed, we eat some breakfast, and we meet with the uh, ground folks first thing in the morning, and they kind of tell us, hey, your schedule's on board. We'll be working with you during the day. Then we work for about probably almost 12 hours. We work during the day. We work closely with the ground doing experiments. We do maintenance on the space station. Sometimes we just do cleaning up here. And, of course, we do a lot of exercise. We uh, lift weights on a resistive device. We run on a treadmill or we exercise on an exercise bike. That's about two and a half hours of our day every day. And then after, at the end of the day, we have another meeting with the, with the ground folks to uh, discuss any issues that are outstanding for the work that we accomplished during the day. And then we get a couple hours to relax, eat some dinner, and, uh, and then we go to bed, sleep for eight hours, and repeat. Thank you. Hi, I'm Emily, and I would like to know what your favorite part about being in space is. Uh, you know, that's pretty easy for me, and I would say it's floating. Um, I absolutely love floating around. It, it's something that never gets old. Um, you enjoy it uh, even when you're working, and uh, floating allows you to do things that obviously you can't do down on Earth. Uh, for example, when, when you're working on, uh, when you're working on a, a, an experiment or something like that, you can put yourself in a position or an orientation that fits whatever job you're doing, and oftentimes that means you'll be standing on the ceiling uh, upside down, that, but really there's no upside down up here. Thank you. He likes hanging from the ceiling. <laughs> Hi, my name is Abby. What is the funniest thing about being in space? <laughs> the funniest thing about being in space? Uh, I don't know. You know, we have a good time uh, as a crew. We kind of joke with each other, and uh, sometimes we joke with the ground a little bit. It's a little more difficult sometimes because they're so far away. But I think, uh, you know, the camaraderie that we share up here is, you know, living up here in this small close quarters for about four months, almost five months together. So I think we have a good time, and we kind of laugh. Uh, every once in a while, the ground will send us up a TV show, and so we'll have a good laugh with that also. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Audrey Carson, and I wanted to know when you decided to become an astronaut. Yeah, that's easy. Uh, actually, I decided or I wanted to be an astronaut when I was sitting in the seats you guys are in right now. Uh, so back in high school, that was uh, the early days of the space shuttle program, and uh, watching you know six, seven launches of the space shuttle every year, and, and seeing the astronauts working in the shuttle and outside the shuttle, uh, I just it, it looked like something that would be absolutely fantastic to do, and uh, and it is. Thank you. Hi, my name is Emily. Um, what is your most embarrassing moment in space? My most embarrassing moment in space. Uh... Oh, I, I don't know. That's a tough question. You know, I guess, it, you know, it's always embarrassing when you're working with the ground and if you, uh, you know, you make a mistake or an obvious mistake. It's not uncommon for me to be reading a procedure and I'll call the ground and say, hey, you know, Houston, what does this mean or what does that mean? And they'll say, well, look at the figure in the next line. I'll say, oh, OK, yeah, that makes sense. And so sometimes, uh, you know, you don't read a procedure properly or carefully and the ground has to remind you that it's it's written right in the procedure. But uh Little things like that are, you know, are nothing to be ashamed of or nothing to worry about because uh, you can't be too proud up here. You got to be, uh, you got to, got to realize that you're human. You're going to make mistakes just because you're up in space doesn't make you any any more different than every, all the folks on the ground. And uh, we make mistakes on a regular basis, and we just live with them. Uh -huh. Thanks. Hello, Colonel Hopkins. My name is Taylor Bales, and I was wondering how this has changed your personal life. You know, I think, uh, or hopefully, it hasn't changed my personal life too much at all. I mean, this is an absolutely incredible experience. It's something I'll never forget. Uh, but at the in the end, uh, we're all the same people we were, um, you know, when we were on the ground. 
And and so, um, you know, overall, I, I think we just have to try and keep it in perspective and, and realize we've been given an incredible opportunity and a gift and a, and a blessing to be here and appreciate that and, and share it with as many people as we can. But uh, really, I hope I hope it hasn't changed uh, changed me that much. Thank you. Hello there, my name's Kelly Zorg, and my question is, if you had a chance, would you bring someone in space with you? Oh yes, there are a lot of people I would bring into space with me. Uh, you know, I know, uh, I'm pretty sure my wife would not come, but I know some of my kids, <laughs> my kids would probably love to uh, come with me. And I know there's probably uh, a lot of folks down in Houston and Huntsville and all around the world who work on the uh, space program for various countries and various organizations who would love to be up here. And, uh, you know, we, we do our best to uh, try to bring them with us in some ways. We bring pictures of folks. We bring pictures of friends and families. We bring pictures of the folks who work down in the uh, mission control centers and who work as engineers around the different centers. And we try to bring some uh, trinkets up with us and share as much as we can with the folks on the ground. So there's a lot of folks who want to be up here. And uh, hopefully in the uh, future years, hopefully 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, uh, space will be open to a lot more people. And I, and I think it is going to be. Cool. Thank you. Hi, my name's Austin, and I was wondering if you've ever worried about what could happen in space. Uh, you know, not not really, I guess. Uh, you know, we do a lot of training. It takes two and a half years of, of training once you're assigned to a mission, and that doesn't include the, the two years of initial astronaut training that you go through. And, and a lot of that training deals with safety and, and how to handle things when they go wrong. And, and so I would say uh, most of the time you, you don't really think that much or you don't dwell on, on the things that could go wrong. And, and then you typically, uh, if something does go wrong, you, all, you tend to uh, just focus on the procedure and what the next step is. And, and really your training kicks in at that point. All right, thank you. And Osage, are you still with us? Hi, my name is Zach Perkins, and uh, I was just wondering if you guys would be quarantined when you return to Earth. Yeah, we don't do quarantine like in the old, uh, when they went to the moon, the Apollo missions that went to the moon and landed on the moon. When those guys came back, I remember when I was a little kid watching, and they would be quarantined for several days or a week or so. I don't know the exact number. But no, we're not quarantined. But uh, when we land, we'll land in Kazakhstan and over near Russia, and they'll fly us, uh, NASA will fly us on an airplane back to Houston overnight. So we'll get back to Houston about 24 hours after landing. And from there, we will get to spend a few minutes with our, saying hello to our families. But then we do go to a special crew quarters for observation for about uh, for overnight for about 24 hours or so and it's not so much as a quarantine it's more of us just they can keep an eye on us and then we also go through a lot of medical testing a lot of uh, data and research is is, uh, is dependent on uh, them getting blood samples and testing us in di various ways so we do have a bit of a commitment after we land to the science that's involved in all of this and to the uh, scientists and the medical folks thank you Hi, my name is Ian Schomburg. I was wondering if you guys exercise more on more in space than you did on Earth. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we exercise, as Rick was saying earlier, two to two and a half hours a day at least. And uh, but the one thing I would say that we don't get, even as you guys are walking around on on the ground under that 1G environment, you're you're getting some exercise. And so even though we exercise probably more than I do on the ground, I think overall, um, you know, we don't we don't challenge our bodies as much as we do on Earth, just because we don't have that uh, that walking around and and all of that 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 you're experiencing right now. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm Gabriel. Uh, what is space madness?
Uh, space madness. That sounds like when, when Mike eats the last tortilla, that, that gets us all pretty mad up here. But <laughs> uh, I've never heard the term space madness. Uh, um, so I'm not sure what that exactly means. I could guess. I guess something maybe comes from a movie or something. But, you know, I don't know if I've ever seen space madness up here. I have seen frustration. You know, frustration is a uh, not uncommon up here. Uh, when we're dealing with a, a lot of different pieces of hardware and we're communicating with folks on the ground, sometimes we get frustrated because things don't work the way we expect them to work, or sometimes we just get tired, or sometimes uh, communication with the ground is just not working clearly. So, you know, there's a certain amount of that going on, but I've yet to see any space madness. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brock Henry, and what position did you play in football, and what is your favorite memory of it? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of memories uh, from playing football, both at Osage at the uh, University of Illinois. Um, at Osage, I played both quarterback and linebacker, and actually when I was freshman, sophomore, I was playing a little bit at uh, wideout as well and at uh, defensive back. Uh, college, I, I my first year at Illinois as a walk-on, I was um, I was on the scout team offense as a quarterback, and then I, I moved into the defensive backfield, and uh, that's where I spent the, the last four years. And there I played all the positions, corner, strong safety, free safety. Um, boy, the most memorable moment. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of them. Uh, certainly when we beat uh, Colorado uh, the year they won the championship up at Illinois, that was, uh, that was a great experience. Um, never losing to Ohio State. Sorry for any Ohio State fans out there. That was uh, also very memorable. And, uh, but overall, just every chance you got to run out on the field um, and, and play the game uh, was, is, is just something I'll, I'll always cherish. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hannah, and my question was, how do you sleep with zero gravity? Well, actually, uh, sleeping up here is very, very comfortable. We just have a sleeping bag. We don't have a bed. We just hang our sleeping bag. We have a very small crew quarters. It's the size of a, a very small closet, like, like a linen closet, if you know what those are. And it's, so it's very small. You just hang your sleeping bag up on the wall. And you simply crawl in there and go to sleep, and you're kind of your arms kind of float out like this, and uh, it's very comfortable. And it's kind of weird because as I'm sleeping, sometimes I'll sleep and I'll wake up and I'll feel like I'm laying down, and then if I open my eyes and, and my brain readjusts, I'll feel like I'm standing up. And so it's uh, your brain can kind of make all these different uh, interpret interpretations of whether you're laying down or standing up. But it's uh, sleeping up here is actually very very comfortable, and uh, I think. My, my concern is when I get back home and I have to sleep in a 1G environment, I'm probably going to have some problems getting used to it again. Thank you. Hi, my name's Dalton Glenny. Uh, how much do you weigh on the ISS? Yeah, so we don't weigh uh, we don't weigh anything up here. We still have mass, and so we'll actually measure our mass, and we can equate that to what we would weigh down on Earth under a 1G environment. Um, and so, actually, up here, I've lost a little bit of weight. I've probably lost uh, five to five to ten pounds, and so it's about uh, about 180 right now. Thank you. Gentlemen, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules and to having this conversation with School of the Osage. We are so very proud of you, uh, Mike Hopkins, and uh, being a part of our memories here at School of the Osage, and what an inspiration you have been to all of our students. Thank you very much. Well, Mike, and... Oh, they're clapping. Well, I just want to say uh, thanks to, to everybody there at School of the Osage. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm absolutely so proud to be an alumni of School of the Osage, and, and I'm just, uh, I want to say thank you as well to, to all of the teachers and everybody there, because uh, for all you kids, all your students there, uh, you are getting a great start in life. Take advantage of it. Follow your dreams. And uh, it's, uh, it's just a, a wonderful experience, a wonderful place to grow up. Thank you. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you, School of the Osage. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.